Welcome to the Sunday recap. This is our new format, TRGers, and welcome guests. Um, we do the Dino recap of the previous week for the first uh, 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to start with that. Then we're going to do the reopen. And then after the reopen gets going, we'll see kind of if there's some stuff to trade and whatnot. And if not, we go to part two um, of the Dino session that we used to do on Fridays, which is a, a little bit about psychology. And then today we're also doing um, a little bit of discussion of the upcoming uh, summer scalping boot camp with the jigsaw tools. And um, I also have a couple of questions people have given me. And um, and I'll, as usual on Sundays, it's always AMA, open Q&A on pretty much any topic. So um, that's what we'll be doing. So let me get my screen. Did I share my screen? No, I didn't. Okay, let me get that done first. And then let's jump right into the weekly recap because that was a pretty crazy week. Um, and uh, you know, m most experience will trade the experienced traders will tell you that, um, you know, particularly uh, from a bigger picture point of view, obviously intraday scalping, um, not as much, but um, where the market closes is considered important. <laughs> and um, when we close on a Friday at the low of the session on just massive volume, that's not particularly bullish. It's it's a long liquidation with a lot of volume. And um, that's what we had Friday. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, that kind of sentiment continues into the reopening today. And um, more importantly, regular trading hours open tomorrow morning. But this is kind of like a, a preview of it first. So real quickly, let me just put up a couple of things just to kind of put everything into a reference point. These are the dailies over the last two years, uh, left to right, NQ, ES, YM, RTY. And um, we've been talking about this in TRG for you know a month, actually more than that, about three months. You know, there's been a, a real strong move up. You know, it started in NQ and then ES joined and YM joined. RTY hasn't coined quite joined that party, but it is at the top of its you know, old low range over here on the far right. The others are almost at their all-time highs, which is very interesting, and demonstrating very strong moves up this year from the week this yesterday or last year. So this is good perspective because if you look over here on you know the far right top of any one of these, you know, that big giant thick bar down, well guess what? That that's Friday. But um it really didn't do a lot of damage. You know, it, it took us out of the attempt to break out to the all-time high again, but we're pretty much, you know, in the same range. It just tapped the previous range of, you know, this is this week, this is last week, and I'm going to break down into that a little more clearly. But so I always find perspective is important, and the perspective I get when I look at this is uh, it did damage to the week, but it didn't damage the strength of that move by a heck of a lot. And so that's interesting kind of, thing to consider number one. Oh, you know what? Let me just uh, minimize all the jigsaw stuff so we don't look at it right now because nothing's happening there yet. Okay, so that, that's kind of part one. Part two, let's look at the weeklies. And um, each one of these little groups of uh, squiggly lines, those are the VWAP and the extremes of the VWAP measured in standard deviations from the VWAP. And I, I use one, two, three, and four. And uh, the lines are the dashed ones or the ones and the kind of orangey, you know, that's two. And then the lighter color is three and the red is four. All right. So if you look at this week, particularly in NQ, this is interesting. So this is this week. And basically, you know, we start out like we always do kind of in a range and the rain got crushed a couple of days ago and then it consolidated around for a while and then it got crushed again. And interestingly, this was within value for the, the week. You know, we, we didn't get all that far from the VWAP. Although the VWAP was coming down a little bit, this doesn't look awful either. What's interesting about it is, well, where did that put us with respect to the previous weeks? So here's that low. It did put us at a fairly good extreme of the previous week. And guess what? That was the exact same extreme spot. Those are both SD3s of the two weeks before it. So basically, you know, we... We erased two weeks of, of movement up, but we didn't do a whole lot of damage down yet. But let's see where we are. You know, we're, we're right here. And again, like I said, the previous two weeks we hit. But if we were to do that with the week before that, which was one of those really strong weeks up, we'd have to be all the way down here. And I'll read that to you. That is 14,723. 
the NASDAQ is at 15,362. So that's a, a decent ways away. And you know, those kinds of areas are worth watching. And you, know, you can do the same thing with the ES. It, it pretty much followed the same pattern. It's the one on the left here. You know, overall, it actually, you know, doesn't look like we left value that far, but we did take out the low of the previous week. And we got, we actually got to the point where we, we weren't even near an extreme. We were so far down, we weren't in an extreme of the previous week. But if we go to the week before that, look at that, we caught it right at, you know, SD3. So again, all of the major indexes, what they have done is they have erased two weeks of, of moves up and they are threatening to go into the week before that, which was the one we went up really, really strong. We did that a couple of times, but that's one of them. So the potential, if we get into that range, could be uh, much more downside. On the other hand, you know, we could hold here. We could go back up and see all-time highs. You know, I work hard not to try to predict what happens, just to kind of read what is happening. And and this is interesting. And that's that's the best I can give you for it. I don't have a better way to describe it. I don't think it's as as bearish as Friday felt. But Friday could have been the early warning, you know, the canary in the coal mine. So, um, by the way, if you have any questions or comments, stick them in the chat. I will get to them. I'm also going to take a real quick two seconds. Um, yeah, I've got your question ready to go, Tony. In fact, you can see on my screen, I've got it right. Uh, I moved it. I've got it right here ready to go so I could answer it if you showed up. So I'm glad you did. I will answer that one when we get to Q&A, which is part of the um Part of the session, but we're not going to do that quite yet. Hang on one second. I'm going to go run a tea I forgot that is in the uh, other room. I'll be back in a second. I'm just going to go grab it. By the way, we have some guests in attendance today. Okay. So for those of you who are new to this and are wondering maybe what Jeff's talking about, Dino is Dino the dinosaur. In other words, the really old guy, Jeff. So there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. yeah, we got a few folks here who aren't regular stuff. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm 63 and I've been trading for almost 50 years. Um, and I started on my birthday, on my 13th birthday. And um, yeah, I'm kind of a dinosaur. I, I've forgotten more about trading than most people have had to learn, you know, all the technical analysis stuff that's useless today and all that. Anyway. You've been trading a couple months longer than I have been alive. That'll make you feel young. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, every, every now and then. I say that to, to somebody because, you know, I get this, you know, it's happened to me before. I've been trading for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. They'll, oh, yeah. They'll come at me like, what do you know? I've been trading for 10 years. And I'll say, and how old are you? I'm I'm 35. I'm 42. All right. Okay. I've been trading longer than you've been alive. <laughs> you know, leave it at that. Okay. How long do you keep the this trade strategy? Uh, I, I suspect, Roman, do you mean how long has he been doing this strategy? That's kind of how I'm interpreting that, but if you can yeah, clarify, or, that'd be good. Yeah, or, and and what strategy is it that we're talking about? Because I, 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 I'm a scalper, and it's not really a strategy that I trade. I, I, it's I a scalp. technique. Yeah, it's a technique that I've just practiced over and over, and and I'm constantly adapting it to market conditions. So it's not like it's some sort of you know system that I trade, you know, and I, I buy here and I sell here, you know, my risk is one tick and my target is four ticks. Yeah, that's all nonsense. Markets don't work like that. You know, you have to be very adaptive. So anyway, clarify your question if you could. Let's continue. So, uh, so the weeklies look interesting, but you can't take away from that what happened at the close, uh, you know, and just grab any index, you know, um, and it got crushed. And this is one of the ways I like to look at the market in the very short term. I use these LRCs and I use very fast. These are five second charts. And, you know, obviously we flattened out at the end, but, you know, that sell off that came late in the day, look at the energy to this downside. I mean, it started up here, which was pretty much the high of the day. And if we go back, you know, there's the value area high right there. And, you know, we were just teetering around at it. And then once the market started selling, which was right here, and not coincidentally at the edge of one of the LRC ranges, that's they're really good at showing you the current boundaries of the, the behavior. And because LRCs are regression and regression says, give me a bunch of data points and I'll show you the best fit. You know, not the high and the low, just the best fit. And this works really well. So if you look at the, the these numbers on here are the wave volume. And, you know, we are kind of going back, this is called ebb and flow in, in TRG. It's in my, as Lee would say, nomenclature, I, um, nomenclature, I, it's a term I use for when the market's roughly in balance and in value. And we're doing it here, you know, we go, you know, 
down uh, 700 contracts, now up 700 contracts, down 400, up 200. You know, the market was just kind of in ebb and flow. Everybody was agreeing on the price. Everything was cool. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, look at the difference in the volume. You know, the first pulse down was 2.5K, which took out the recent low, which was pretty aggressive also at 4K. And then it couldn't bounce even, you know, a couple of points. And then down another 2K and then 3K more and then 2K more. And this is the volume. And that's called slamming the bid. And somebody is really aggressively selling when that's going on. And uh, one of the things I love to do is, you know, fade the edges of, of moves. And this is one you just don't fade because it just kept getting crushed. And um, finally, you know, it settled down right at the close and it closed at the low of the session. And the ES did exactly the same thing. And yeah, this, again, just looking at that, that would be fairly bearish. But again, putting it into context the way that I showed you a minute ago, here's ES doing the same thing. Um, um, you know, uh, it's not a good sign for the longs, but it's not the end of the world yet either. You know, we kind of need to see what happens next. So with that in mind, um, that's kind of the recap. There's really not much else to say, but I, I want to make a couple of points real fast here because we're going to have the reopen in about three minutes. So let's jump to that and then we'll come back to questions and and comments about the upcoming classes and stuff. So here's the deal. When the market closes at the low on a Friday, particularly when there's an aggressive move down like that, there's almost always an attempt for it to bounce because futures traders don't take contracts home over the weekend. So everybody making money on the short on that way down needed to cover. So we should have seen a bounce. Well, guess what? We didn't. And that's a long liquidation if you're a market profile student. Um, take a look at the TPO view of that. You know, I'll, I'll stretch it out a bit just to blow it up. This is Friday. That blue is where we closed, you know, literally at the bottom on a lot of volume. And so this is the deal on the Sunday reopen. The, the thing we're about to potentially trade here, Sundays are very interesting. What, what Sundays do basically is they price in everything that happened since we closed. Um, over the weekend. And this weekend's been relatively news quiet. So it will be very interesting to see what the reopen looks like relative to the close. So the first thing I kind of want to do is bring up a footprint of the close. Again, you can just see all this selling volume. And, you know, right there for, uh, for ES, you know, 44.98. So it'll, and, and there's a lot of volume there. So it'll be interesting to see what we do with that spot. Um, and again, I'll get to the questions in, in just a few minutes, but let's get the reopen open because often the Sunday reopens a little slow. But in case it isn't, I want everybody to be all caught up and I have like one minute to finish this. So um, what we want to do is watch the volume. That's what's critical. If it's in the hundreds, then it's probably not going to be a significant event at the reopen. But typically, you know, there might be some people who had positions left on at the close. They have to square them up or they're going to reinitiate positions for this week. Um, you know, we don't, we have some big numbers this week, but they're a little later in the week. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So first let's watch the reopen. There's two setups I look for, and I will explain them as we see the volume. The volume tells me which one I'm looking for. If we get a big chunk of volume and we get a big gap, that could be a gap and go setup. And I want to look potentially to join it. Um, or if we get a big chunk of volume and a gap, and then nothing happens after that, I'll look to fade that gap because the second thing, which is much more likely on a Sunday, is if we get a big move, we, we end up back in a range. So here we go. We opened on 300 contracts and it no gap whatsoever. We opened literally on the, the price we closed on. So very low volume. This is not a significant event at all yet. It might become one. But um, the second setup we get on Sundays is my favorite thing to trade. I trade it every Sunday overnight frequently um, is the range. We, it, what will happen is Sunday reopen, we'll build a range. And once that range is kind of established, we can start trading it, you know, fading one end of it or the other or trading inside out from the middle of it to the edges. So what we want to see kind of here is, uh, is how far this goes. Now the volume is picking up a bit. We're at 1,000 already. That's reasonably fast. But I don't trade right away into a Sunday reopen unless there's a gap to trade. Um, if it's going to build a range like this, I give it about 15 minutes to do it. Um, kind of like I give uh, the uh, regular trading hours five minutes. You know, it, basically, that's the price discovery. Everyone's kind of getting their orders up and trading, and, and it gives us a little time to get a sense of what's going on. 
volume continues to pick up here. So, and now we're up a little bit. This is interesting. You know, we're always well correlated on the reopen. We're way above the range of the close. So this could be a potential spot to play short. That's actually an interesting idea right here. Let's do that just for a quickie. I just grabbed a, a little five micro short here because it seems like it might be an inflection point. One reason is I'm just looking at my LRC here and we're, we're testing right at the edge of the range at the close. So let's see if we can get a little quick, you know, 25 or 50 bucks. I like to use my dome like an ATM, you know, give me a $20 bill here. That'll be a $20 bill right there. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to play a little bit this with this. If this can push up a little higher, I might scale it just a bit because it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of energy here. And I, I'm seeing absorption into the ask. Um, they're going to try to push that higher. We might be able to get zero, zero going here, in which case we'll get a little more aggressive shorting this, but, um, I don't think anything structural is going to be real useful. Yeah. You can see there was a big absorption at the close there and we're above that. So um, let's see. There we go. Okay, we oh, we almost got our twenty dollar bill. I got close. So again, I'm just doing that kind of a little warm up. I like to warm up my brain, and you know, I can catch a quick scalp. That's a good spot to have added to it. There, there's a lot of selling. We're below there. So um, there we go. There's our twenty dollar bill warm up with five micros. Just you know, quick scalp, and yeah, edge of the range and absorption um, at the edge of the previous LRC range. By the way, that's gonna expand almost immediately because it's um, you know no longer looking at Friday, it's looking at the new data, but the previous data it has is obviously Friday's range because we just opened. So, all right, um, so that was a good little warm up. I'm not in a hurry to do a whole lot more up here. You know, if it gets a little higher and I see more absorption, I might while we're talking, but let's go ahead and kind of transition real quickly to one of the other things we do on Sunday. Sunday's always open Q&A and Sunday is always ask me anything. And I got a question from Tony um, over the weekend um, and I wanted to answer it real quickly. To do so, I'm going to put my jigsaw domes away for a moment and uh, I'm just going to get a, something to draw with. And um, oh, you know what? I, I did that just a little too fast because... I wanted to get the question first, and unfortunately, Zoom doesn't have the intelligence to change from the drawing tool to the pointing tool when you're pointing at something you don't want to draw on. Okay, so this was the question. Small ranges on big range days. And this is a question from one of the videos in the library, one of the um, scalping workshop videos. And um, the breakout of the small range is the golden goose, a small range on a big, big range day. That's what I said in the video. And we should watch direction, momentum, and avoid inflection points. Okay, and then the question was, is this avoidance of the inflection points because they can create false breakouts? And the answer is no, I don't care about breakouts. They're meaningless to me or for another reason. Well, it's another reason is the answer. And it's a really simple one. Like most things in good trading, it's not complicated. You don't need to buy some silly indicator to see it. It's just, you know, the state of the trade. So now I'm back to drawing. Let's say the, the session range, you know, is like Fridays and it's really big. So, you know, let's say that's the session range high and low. And just for fun, let's talk about the reversal that happened. So, you know, in this particular case, we opened like kind of up here. Um, and let's switch colors just because that'll be easier to read. So hang on one second. Let me get rid of that and just grab a different color here. Let's use that. Okay. So now it's still the eraser. I want the drawing tool. There we go. Now it changed the color. Okay. So, you know, if you go back and look at the where the initial balance was and where the high of the day was, I just showed it to you on my LRC views. We opened kind of here-ish. And, you know, we went up pretty strongly and then we had a little pullback and then we went up and we established this high. And then we kind of just hung out up there. I, I was showing you that on the LRC until we got to the point where we started to break out of there. So, you know, the move up here had a pretty good sized range. But once we got up here, the range the market was in was really, really tight. So this is an example of a very small range in a very big range day and even better that small range is right at the edge of the session so it isn't about whether it's a breakout or a false breakout tony it's about risk management that's what you're doing here and and my answer to you in the the private messages was we'll just look at the statistics of this you know if we go up here it's you know temporarily uncharted territory we haven't been up there and in a breakout that's kind of technical analysis nonsense. The futures trade much 
faster. And, you know, by the time a technical analysis setup shows up, it, it's typically, you know, over a half an hour ago. So hang on one second. All right, much better. I had to take off the sweatshirt. Anyway, so, um, so here's what was going on up there and what made that so powerful. So let me leave that color and grab one more color. Let's see, let's try blue. And um, so if I just look at the range up here, that was it. So I have a very tight, predictable range. And this is the example in the video that you're talking about. This is the holy grail because if we get up here, it's uncharted territory and I just have to wait till they stop buying it and then it's a good fade or wait, you know, if it's really breaks into a trend, sure, buy the pullback, but that's not likely at the high of the day on a Friday when we've been ebb and flow for three hours. It's just not likely. What's much more powerful is if we go the other way because we've been in here, like I said, for hours. If this low goes, this is potentially the target. So the potential to take that trade with the risk being, well, maybe it breaks out, is just so astronomically in your favor, it's the holy grail. That's the answer to your question. It's no more complicated than that. Um, now, again, if I have a really small range in the middle of the whole session, yeah, that might be useful, but that's much less statistically interesting unless I have a real strong reason to believe it's going to break one edge or the other, like if it was you know, before the initial balance was formed, but this is later on in the session, so that wouldn't apply. Um, likewise, when we got down here at the end of the day, it became a very interesting trade to look for maybe a move back into the range. We never really got it, but in the Friday closing session, I was able to show a couple of examples where you could have done that and made a little money. But it, what it was a better idea in this whole situation was, you know, the minute it left that range up there, get short and just kind of hold on for the ride because, you know, that was such a powerful period that we were in. So that's that's literally all it is. Don't don't overthink these things. Um, it's easy to do that. And it's easy also. And people do this all the time. And it, it's it's really common. And it's a really good thing to avoid trying to take something new that somebody's teaching and reframe it into something you already understand, like breakouts. If you go back to the videos, it, actually, let me rephrase that. If you go through the TRG videos and there's, oh, I don't know, about 3,000 of them now, and we have, uh, I don't know, literally tens of thousands of hours. I have never used the word breakout. A breakout, again, is a, an old false kind of technical analysis way of trading that's really silly. You know, it can work better in equities if you trade equities because equities are trading against a, a perceived value, you know, whatever the value of that stock is and is it growing and yada, yada, what are the earnings? Futures don't work that way. Futures are a derivative of the cash indexes. So it's all about the energy of what's going on in the cash and how are the futures reacting to it. So um, why didn't I take more than $20? Because I wanted to explain this and you, you, never, you never take less, you always wanna take what the market will give you. And in the conditions right now, if you look at the price, Roman, we're not moving at all. So I actually was very fortunate to pull a 20 out of that that quickly. Um, let's see, am I watching ES volume right now? Mm, I am, and it's, you know, given that we're nine minutes in, it's, it's just barely getting interesting. And we'll get back to that. We have plenty of time to do that and talk more about the reopen. I just wanted to answer this question. And uh, let me get back to Tony real quick. Um, does this answer your question? If you have a follow-up question, please stick it in the chat. I will address it. Meanwhile, I'm going to erase this stuff and I'm going to switch back to my pointer. Perfect. Okay, Tony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's see. JF. Hi, good afternoon. I'm new. The host said he's been trading for 50 years. Yes, I did. Has he found any magic indicator? Um, no, in fact, the exact opposite. Magic indicators and crystal balls are complete friggin' nonsense. You learn how to trade by watching the traded volume. That's the only thing that works consistently. And that's what we do on here. Ooh, now this is getting interesting again, potentially. Let's see. Hmm. Looking at this is a crunched ball. Oh, I didn't explain what's on these screens. So uh, there are two MNQ domes over here. This is NQ that isn't crunched together here where my pointer is. This one to the right of it is NQ, but I've crunched it together. And instead of tick by tick, it's four ticks at a time. So it's moving a point at a time. And then the thing next to it is called a liquidity map. 
And I'm seeing the liquidity that's being put up, like up here, there's some big liquidity. Wherever it's whiter is more. And then we're seeing the traded volume into the liquidity. That's what that's plotting. And that's very powerful. Liquidity is people putting orders up and saying, you know, I might do something. An order is I might do something. And the traded volume is it did, it happened. They did it. So watching the interaction of what people say they're going to do and what's actually happening is very powerful. And that's basically what I do. That's, that's the technique. And, and, and again, there's no indicators that do it. You know, this is just showing me the volume and these round circles are showing me bulges of the volume and I can tune that to be, you know, more or less. And, um, you know, that's the holy grail in trading is to learn how to read the darn traded volume. It tells you everything you need to know. Okay, um, real quick, I just want to, speaking of traded volume, I just want to take another quick look at the structural view here. Yeah, we've got unfinished business. We just finished it at the top of the first period here. We traded through some old supply that was right above us. And so we're kind of right on the one of the spots the market broke down for. These are half hour uh, market profile periods from Friday's close over here. And then this one with the blue on it is our first period today that we're in right now. So you know, I wouldn't short this. I wouldn't buy it either. Let's see if it can push farther up on an extreme. That gets interesting for a short. You take a look at the LRCs. You know, the top of the range is like 11 right now, but we're kind of moving up. So, you know, between 11 and 20 might be the first place it could get interesting. We'll keep an eye on that. But that's still, you know, a little bit above us. And, you know, the same patterns going on in the EF. A um, little bit of buying, but it's not real aggressive and it's not enough volume to really be convinced anybody is really aggressive. And we are seeing some absorption right here. That's what those red circles are. You know, in other words, it's trading on the bid, but we're not going down. So if they exhaust the sellers up here, we'll push out of there too. And you can see liquidity is up at 10 in ES and a lot of liquidity is up at 17 to 20 you know, a whole lot more than there is down here. So, you know, that people are advertising they want to sell up there. Likewise, you know, around two in NQ. And, uh, you know, whether they actually do, if we get there or not, is a different story. But they're, you know, they're throwing bids up and asks up and saying, yeah, you know, I'll trade there. Okay, that's fine. So um, is the short, short still working from earlier? No, we, we took the quick $20 bill, remember? So we keep shorting as it goes up. No, I just said the exact opposite. <laughs> I said, you wait for an inflection point in the traded volume and you're looking for um, a sign that whatever motion we have at the moment is, is waning. And then that gives you a good decision point to potentially trade. For example, look at the domes right now. And there's a lot of trading um, on the bid down at 80 or so, you know, and then we got up here and now we're seeing a little bit more of it around 90, you know, on the pink side, that's trading on the bid. In other words, the market is being sold if we go below that and the market's being bought if we go above it. That's a real simple way to look at that. Um, and again, in the jigsaw class, we go into this in a lot of detail. And in the, um, the tick maker classes, which are the $25 online classes that we offer, there's e even better detail on just how to understand the order flow and traded volume. So anyway, over here on the far right, um, I didn't get that far before. That's ES, as I said, and the liquidity for ES. This one's YM, this one's RTY. So I can see all four indexes at the same time. They're all at their highs. So I wouldn't short this now is the answer to your question. Um, also, the uh, let's see, hold on. Um, let's see, what would a guy do to get a real good at trading short-term ranges? Also, the time of day best to do this. Well, if you're skilled enough to trade the open, the open's the best time of day to do anything for as a scalper because you get fast movement and, and it can go a long way. So, you know, that, that's our open five setup and the 15 minute break and the initial balance trades, you know, what Surfer Dude and Video Game Guy do, particularly Surfer Dude, he's, he's a really aggressive trader at the open. But some people find the open very hard to read quickly. And sometimes I do too. I find the best intro, the best, ranges that aren't at extremes they aren't ledge range you know ledge extremes but the middle of the session or a nice tight lrc range absolute best time of the day to trade those is the rookie roast the midday because if we go to the edge of a range the odds are really high we won't break out of it in the middle of the day generally if we're going to break out of ranges we would have done it in the morning or we'll do it going into the close but the middle of the day you know the old pit traders called it the rookie roast because, you know, the pit traders and all the really serious traders were out drinking martinis and, you know, only really rookies tried to trade the middle of the day and so called rookie roast. So it's a much more tradable range time. 
So, um, and as far as the tactics, it's the same things we use all the time, Jeffrey, but you have to totally focus on the short-term ranges. And, um, and that takes a little practice. You know, if we're at a ledge, it's really easy to do. But, you know, if we're like at this condition, we're at a ledge, but the LRCs are saying, well, you know, we're not at any sort of extreme yet, um, then, you know, that's harder to gain because you don't really have any sort of statistical basis to leave it, you know, to, to say that's it. Um, by the way, just making a point, you know, why did I only take $20 out of that trade? Well, number one, I'm doing an example. Number two, it was five micros. So I did it with five minis. It would have been 200 bucks. Everything in trading is scalable, but you have to manage risk. And, you know, that's just not the kind of risk I would take at the reopen. I wouldn't put on five, you know, minis. That would be, you know, just a suicidal because, you know, you can get a sudden move of, you know, 30 or 40 points against you and you're screwed. You know, it's thousands of dollars. So, you know, that's just good risk management. Um, let me know if you have a follow-up to that, uh, Jeffrey. That That's the answer to your question. By the way, great questions, guys. Keep them coming. Um, let's see. What time is it? All right, so we're at 317. I think this has basically pretty much told us um, what it's doing today. You know, this reopen is a range reopen. We have, you know, this is not a gap and go at all. You know, the gap's way too small. It's only seven points in ES and what, 27 in uh, NQ. So this is going to build a real nice range. So a real weak attempt to push through the high right now, I would potentially look to start shorting. But again, I'd, I wouldn't just do it based on that. I'd want to see that, uh, you know, it's getting sold up there and that it's getting absorbed. The buyers are getting absorbed. In other words, it's getting sold. And that gives me really good odds to go back into the range. And, um, and right now, that range is just not big enough yet. We're not extreme enough. Also, NQ, which I like to trade. I trade, you know, pretty much everything, but I specialize in NQ and MNQ. And, and it has some very interesting inflection points that we see over and over again. And it's at one right now, 92. And almost always when the high 90 or the low 90s trade will at least trade to zero zero and that's up here you know so that's not a bad first idea is you know throw an order up there on a sudden pop up i probably get filled so th that's a good tactic for the conditions we have right this second but i wouldn't just keep in short and into that oh here it comes okay so this is what i was talking about we got to 95 there's not a lot of energy behind this at all but the volume has gotten decent see that absorption right there at 95 but we just didn't pull back so I can also reset these guys so I can see them, you know, just clean and then leave the volume over here on NQ and the crunched NQ. So we can kind of watch it as it's happening. That's cool. So see all the trading on the blue there? It's getting absorbed here, but it's not going down. So we're probably still going to get a pop up. That's um, that's a good bet right now. Whether it gets all the way up to me at there at 99.75, might not. I tend to, whenever I put up limits like that, the TRGs, I'm famous for in live sessions. It'll miss me. It'll pop up and miss me by a tick. And, and, you know, I'm just, I'm in the right spot when that happens. That just means that, you know, that's exactly the right spot to grab a fade. Okay. Now we're seeing some trading on the ask it's blue and we should trade above that um, because we're right on it. That's we're in the, we're seeing buyers getting absorbed, but it's not going down. So they might, um, they might exhaust the sellers here. I'm, I'm just tuning that out a little less sensitive so we can see maybe a little more circles um, in ES. It's just, there's just no volume over there. There's more interest uh, in NQ at the moment. So let's see if that pops through. Anyway, that that's, um, like I said, this is my favorite setup on Sundays. Just, you know, let the range build. And then, you know, when it pops through an extreme, oh, look at that, it just did it again. It traded 98 quarter. I'm at 99.75. It totally got absorbed and I didn't get a fill because I'm just slightly too far away. Uh, you know, it was a little too ambitious. And then look at where it is now. That's a five point trade. And, you know, that that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. And I still don't think we're done. But again, if I'd gotten filled there, I would have immediately taken profits back to Roman's question. Because when you have profit, the first thing you want to do is protect it. You don't try to get more. That's a really common rookie mistake. Got to let the trade work. My target is 20 points away. Nonsense. How do you know where the market's going to go? You don't. When it starts becoming profitable, you protect that profit, and then you get whatever you get. It's that simple. Okay, let's see. So it's shorts only, no longs, because the trend is down. No, I have said nothing like that, JF. <laughs> I, I don't trade trends. And, and I don't see anywhere on here where you could see a, a downtrend anyway. I mean, if you were looking at a trend, the market's in a really weak move up right now. So I'm looking to short it because I just described why it's getting absorbed. And so again, 
NQ has spots it likes to play. Zero, zero is the next one up. I should get a fill on the next push here. And we might even be able to get a little bit more at two and a half, maybe five. Those are typical places where it'll pause and turn like it just did really hard. You're looking to be in the trade for as short a period as time at the optimal spot, jump in, grab a great entry and immediately get profit and get right back out. A scalper takes money out of the market. We don't sit in trades. My average trade is 30 seconds long. And uh, the one we did already was um, a long one. That took us a minute, that last one I did. Okay, this ledge is gonna blow here, which is why you wouldn't just stay short, but I should get filled this time. So let's see, this will be fun. Again, I'm gonna reset just that one. And what will I try to get out of this? I'd probably try to get right about the top of value right now, maybe 94. So the second that fills, you'll see me throw a target up here. Um, and uh, then we'll let it. I don't want to put a target up now because until that fills, the target will end up becoming a long. And this is not a long setup. Okay, it may become one though. Again, I'm not just saying this is a short. I'm saying at the moment, we're getting absorbed at the ledge of the session. That's a short. If the ledge blows and all of a sudden there's a lot of volume to the upside, it would be an okay long. But in general, again, on Sundays, trying to go with a move like that is, is silly. You're much better off fading the edges of the range because right now the VWAP's down at 85. And, you know, either we ha it has to come up to us or we have to get down to it. You know, that's how value is determined. Although that doesn't necessarily happen right away or even on the same day, but again, general guidelines. So, and I'll talk more about that stuff in just a second. Um, after I do the second half of the normal Dino Sunday reopening session, the psychology part, uh, we are gonna talk about the upcoming um, scalping class, the jigsaw class. I'm gonna talk about the schedule on that and what some of the things we're gonna be doing are. So stay tuned for that. That will be right after the Dino part and we're coming up on that in just a minute. Just wanna keep an eye on this and see what happens. Look at all this trading on the bid. So basically, People are selling and somebody is buying every, every contract they sell right now and we're not going down very much. Now, if this picks up and we start getting some downside momentum, you know, then it, it's, you see the result of the selling. But at the moment, it hasn't really pushed it down much, you know, just a couple of points. And in NQ, that's nothing. You know, it moves around 10, 20 points at a time when it wants to. And this is a very tight range for NQ. Um, what I'm watching on these two tapes here, this is NQ. Um, in a kind of a time and sales that's reconstructed using the CME algorithm. This is literally every trade that's happening live. So this is traded volume. And I'm seeing where it's happening. Like see all those trades into the bid and then we, put, we push down. So I'm seeing the selling as it's happening. They're pushing into the bid and the buyers there are getting run over at least for a second. And look where that just got absorbed right at 94. Remember I said, if I got filled up here at 99, I'd target 94. Well, that's exactly where the buyers just stepped right back up right there. So this one on the left is, is the same thing, only I'm, I'm just filtering for five or more because that lets you see absorption, like see at 98, 12, above the ask. So they pushed it above the ask and somebody up there just said, sure, I'll take every one you want to buy and sell it to you. And then sure enough, we came right back down. So that's, that's how I read that. And again, in the class, we'll talk a lot more about that, but just so you guys can kind of see what's on my screen. And this is all I use to trade. I, I don't use anything else. There's no, no indicators, no you know, magic, holy grail. Um, you know, Algo Box 9000 or any of that nonsense. You know, the, look, anybody that's selling that kind of stuff to you, you're doing yourself a disservice by spending money on that. Some of those things work some of the time, like any tool, but they're not worth spending money on. And it's not worth trading that way because conditions change constantly and you have to be trading what's happening, not what, the, not what your indicator that's a trend follower is saying, because the vast majority of the time in the futures market, there are no trends. It, it, the, the futures market moves around in ranges. It pushes the boundaries of a range. It pushes the boundaries the other way. It very, very rarely trends. And when it does, it almost never trends for a whole session. When it does do that, which is about 12% of the days, um, it's unusual, but you know, we get that. Like when we have a gap up in the morning and we just keep going up all day, you know? But interestingly, I make most of my money on the short side on days like that because you know, it's easy to find extremes to, to, to fade back. Um, and you can also trade it the other way and go with ledge breakouts, then you can fade them back. And it, you know, if you're skilled at keeping an eye on what's happening in the traded volume, you can, you can do really well on those days, but they're much harder to trade. You know, the vast majority of the time, the market will open, it will establish the initial balance, which is a, a substantial 
a substantially important range. And then what you have to do is decide how to trade from that. And a really good example of that's what, what happened Friday, the one I was just talking about, you know, when I was saying where you would have, you know, the example with the, the very short range at the top, this is it right here. And, you know, let's just look at what happened at the open. This is uh, ES on Friday's open. So this was because of the NFP number right here, this crazy big move. And then, you know, we basically ended up right back where we started, but we pushed extremes and that was very tradable. In fact, if you came to our MF, NFP session, I traded it. We made a little money. Anyway, so this is what it was like going into the open. It was an ebb and flow. It opened right here where these blue lines start. And um, this was our open five trade was a really nice long. It just opened and it started going up and it never looked back. And it did that for 15 minutes. Then it pulled back a tiny little bit and then it established the initial balance, the blue line. And you know that's when we went into that first little drop, which didn't really get us anywhere. It established, as it usually does, the bottom of the initial balance. This is the first hour. And this is not a massive range. You know, the top was 4550-ish, bottom was like 4520. That's a typical normal day. There's no trend in there. We went up and then we found sellers and we went down. So people trying to trade trends are at a constant disadvantage. By the time a trend indicator would have rolled over and told you that this was a trend move up, it was over. And by the time it told you this was a trend move down, it would have done that right around here. And it, it's over. You know, you, you had plenty of other places where it, you could have sold it just by watching the volume. So, you know, forget the indicators. Um, the colors you're seeing on here are just a very, very short term use of an ATR kind of trailing stop. Um, it, it's, it's called TS Super Trend. And, and it, it's the concept of, um, of uh, what did I, what's that? Uh, Stop and reverse, it's that. So that color changes when it's in a stop and reverse up or down move. And you know, I sometimes take that off, but it just kind of helps me get a sense of the energy of a move like here, you know, around the news, you know, real aggressive down, you know, first it was kind of a head fake. And then, you know, we sold off pretty hard, but once we, you know, found some absorption down there and found the buyers, it, you know, just pretty much worked its way up. And each one of these little bright greens is a higher high again. So that's a little basic trend move. But again, a trend indicator wouldn't have caught that until it was long over. So um, that's why using indicators is not a good idea if you want to consistently make money in futures. Meanwhile, it still hasn't gotten to me, but I'm, I'm three ticks away. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. You can set your watch by that happening. And it used to really frustrate me. And one of my mentors said to me, you know, Jeff, it, it means you're in exactly the right spot, you know, because everybody's trying to get filled there. And, and you know, so... Just keep doing it that way. And, you know, sometimes you'll get fills and there'll be great trades and sometimes you won't, you know. And every now and then if we get close, sometimes I'll, you know, grab one at the market or move the trade down into the range and take the trade, but not on a Sunday because, you know, we can move up dramatically from here and that'll set up a really nice trade. In fact, right now, that's not a great spot to be trying it because we, we don't really have a really clean top here. Um, you know, I'm going to leave that one there just to keep that example, but a better spot right now. You know, I, I look at chunks of 10 to start with. So, you know, this gets us to about 2010, or excuse me, not 20, but uh, what would that be? Four, so yeah, 410. That's an interesting spot. So let's front run that a little bit, maybe eight. That's, a, that's an interesting spot. This one, probably too early if we get up there, but I'll leave it there just so we see if we get a fill. Okay. Absolutely, JF. There's no such thing as a predictive model that does anything but take your money. And they, they, there's people that sell those for $5,000 and they're just as worthless as the $200 ones. Okay, why do I catch- How much of your money they'll take. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> there's some guy selling um, neuro something indicators. He's been around a long time, like, you know, since the late 90s. I, neuro, I forget what it's called, but it's $50,000. And they have this whole dedicated sales force. You ready for this? The salesman- gets 40000 of the $50,000. I was so going to say, what's the commission? <laughs> yeah, so they're really aggressive and they convince all these poor people that, you know, just retired to give them $50,000 of their retirement accounts. And the thing is, quote unquote, a neuro AI predictive model. And it's complete nonsense. All that stuff's complete nonsense. Okay, there was a good question back there. A couple of good questions. I'm in the central time zone with a day job. Is trading the Nikkei of Saka maybe is Okay, there's a, anything... Jigsaw is really good, and, and my technique is really good for anything that has a lot of movement that's liquid. And there are people that trade the Nikkei. 
there's people that trade the DAX. There's people that trade, um, what's the other one? The Euro stocks. Um, there's a bunch of them. I don't have a lot of experience with them because I have not traded any of those. I have traded the, um, the currencies overnight. Those are a good one. Um, again, currency futures, not the FX. That's that's a scam. Um, you know, um, 6E, 6J, there's a bunch of good ones there. Some people like to trade the bonds. That's too slow for me. Oil is a great one if you can learn to read it and understand its rhythm. Um, but um, let's see, you're in uh, trading. Uh, what, do you have a regular nine to five, Steve? Yeah, then. Hmm. You know what? That's a really good question to post in the in the pit. Um, you know, in the anything goes because we have a bunch of Europeans that do trade those other things. And I know Lee, my co-founder in TRG, he has a lot of experience with some of those things. So that that's where I would post that question. That, and it's a really good one. And I know a lot of people talk about it. And there's been conversation in the past. I just generally am not that involved. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, let's see. Uh, Roman, why do I catch 99.75, not 99? Because the inflection point I was trading is zero zero, and I'm front running it by a tick. That's why. Okay, uh, is it possible to rebuild the charts in Sierra instead of Ninja? Absolutely. Everything I do um, in Ninja, everybody that trades in Sierra in our group in TRG has set. There's nothing that I have set up in on these little Ninja views, these little five seconds that you can't do in Sierra. And and people have already done it and they've posted it in TRG. Um, the jigsaw stuff though, with the domes like this, no, you can set up a dome in Sierra chart and it will do some of what jigsaw can do. The thing it doesn't do well is, is, is manage orders. And uh, as a scalper, you know, some people can, can work around it. Lee scalps pretty well with, you know, the domes in Sierra, but um, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's a second choice tool if you're gonna be a scalper. I think the only tools that are really good scalping tools that are out there are Jigsaw and uh, NTT. Um, there's really no other one I would even look at to use. So, you know, forget the Dome and Ninja Trader, forget, uh, God, by all means run as fast as you can from Trade of Eight. Um, and, and there's a few others I'd run fast from too, but good question there. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, JVC, I answered part of that. Uh, yes, yes, I, we will be uploading the recording. Every time we do a public session, we stick it on YouTube and all of our private uh, TRG sessions are stored in our library and all the members have access to the library 24 hours a day. Okay, you mentioned the pit. Do you have any members that trade news flow? Uh, what do you mean by news flow, JF? I don't know what that is. Are you talking, and, and our pit is not that, that Bish pit guy. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but I don't, what is news flow? Do you mean the flow of news? Yeah, I assumed he just meant trading a news feed or something. Trading the news. All right. Well, the first thing you do is turn off the news feed <laughs> because yeah. all, you, all you need to know is what, when it's coming. You can see over here in my lower left-hand corners, this is the Jigsaw economic releases calendar. And I can see like tonight, we've got some Japanese numbers, a summary of opinion, foreign exchange reserves, and then Great Britain a little bit later, the house index. And you know, then as we go through the night, you know, there'll be more things coming up and um, and then, of course, during the week, I'll see the, the larger economic announcements. But that's, that's just to remind me that they're coming up. Um, the, the, the key to trading is to trade what's happening. And, and by definition, if we get a news event, it creates a good opportunity to trade because the market reacts to it. So you trade the reaction. You ignore whatever the result was. You know, what was the NFP? You know, what were all the, the employment numbers? Who cares? <laughs> You know, what's the FOMC going to raise the interest rate by or cut it? Who cares? What you're interested in isn't the reaction to it. So yeah, by definition, that's literally all I do, if that's what you meant. Do we have traders that trade the reaction? That's all I do. Again, JF, I trade news all the time. And there's, there's dozens of examples. In fact, some of those are on our YouTube of, we just did NFP on Friday. That's exactly what I do. I get flat. I let the news happen. I watch the reaction and I look for trades. That's, that's, that's what a good trader does with the news. You, you never try to predict where it might go to and you, know, you just kind of let it overreact. And then, you know, again, the futures are a speculative instrument, but we're a derivative of the equities. Right now, the equities aren't trading. So everything going on right now is pure speculation in the futures market. We have no idea what the equities are gonna do tomorrow morning when they in fact open. 
And people say, well, some of the equities are starting to trade 24 hours. None of that matters. The volume is, is regular trading hours when you know the equity funds are buying and selling equities. That's what matters. And then the futures are a derivative of that. So we can never get very, very far away from wherever the equities are because the two have to get roughly back into sync. And so that just creates massive opportunities when we get these news events, because what they do is they stretch out the distance between the thing that we're derived from, the equities, and us. And, and that snapback creates ridiculous opportunities. That If you're going to be a futures trader, that's the place to find opportunities. When, when the futures are breaking out of ranges and blowing through ledges, or when we're getting so far away from value and so far away from the equities that in, it's very hard to be wrong fading it. And, um, and those conditions set themselves up over and over again every day. So that, that's what you're looking for. That was a good question. Um, yeah, you know, the word news flow, JF, um, I, I spell news N-E-W-Z because it's all nonsense. It's, it doesn't matter what it is. So forget the flow of the news. Trade the flow of the futures contract. And, and when the news adversely affects it and, and gets it to extreme, fade it. And when the news catches traders off guard and, you know, and there's a huge short squeeze or whatever, join it. And it's literally that simple. You just have to learn to read what is in fact happening instead of trying to predict it with some you know, $300 software tool. Um, Let's see. Oh, awesome. That's, that's so cool, Tony. I appreciate the feedback. It seems the market is not moving at all. Yes, Roman, it's not because it's Sunday and we've opened, we've established a very symmetrical range. What does he mean by a symmetrical range? He means look at the volume profile. And this is one of the things we're going to talk about in the class. It's very even. We run out at the top. We run out at the bottom. The VWAP's right in the middle. And guess what? We just traded back to the VWAP. So the market has found value. When it opened, it explored to find value. And that's why this was a short up here, um, because it was an extreme. And you know the market ran out of gas. It got absorbed, and we went back to value. That's what markets do. It's that simple. <laughs> it really is. You mentioned the short squeeze and join it. Do you have a trading? that good it's by uh, me i again i do it all the time and it's very simple the, the a short squeeze is a very simple thing to see uh, what you're looking for jf is a relentless bid that means that people are trapped what do i mean by relentless bid well um i just kind of gave an example of it a minute ago but let me get back to the pointing tool here and um if i'm over here watching the big blocks of volume and again, just for argument's sake, I'm going to cancel these orders and, and let's clean those off. I just reset all the domes. So they're all going to start printing fresh volume. So you can see, Roman, that it is trading. It's just trading really quietly. And so there's just not much happening. And that, again, that's typical once we get open. So let's say, for example, it was going into that close on Friday. That, that was the kind of market you would see a short squeeze in because, okay, let's let me get my little calendar out of the way. All right, look at this condition right here. Remember I said... You know, it was really obvious once this started to break down, it was a waterfall move down. And, you know, when you see those, you just get on, get short anywhere logically you can. Like this little bounce right here was perfect. It, you know, pause for a few, you know, this isn't even a couple of minutes and then boom, <laughs> down again. So when this happens on a Friday, this is a really classic example where you might see a short squeeze. And there's a bunch of examples in our library where we did have one and we traded them. Got, sometimes they can go... I've seen them go hundreds of points in NQ and you know, 30, 40, 50 points in ES at the close. That's how dramatic the movement can be in a short squeeze. And it would look something like this. You know, we dribble down like this and, and there's all these sellers. Okay, to sell into this, you have to get short, which means somewhere down here, you've got to buy it back. You've got to get flat. And to cover a short, you have to buy. So, you know, as it made that low. And, and this is what we did in the Friday closing session. You can go watch that recording. Um, we started talking about it and we saw a couple of short squeezes that were very quick. This was one right here. And what it looks like, you know, a better example, I'll just kind of, you know, draw if it were to have happened. So let's see, this is the close right there. So we closed at the low, but let's say we didn't. Let's say, you know, this was where the low was right there. And then we started to see 
this, okay? A little bit of movement up. All right, so people are buying them back. So I, I see that happening. And the next thing I look at is my tape and watch the price. What will happen is you'll see, you know, a bunch of trades go off on the ask. In other words, that's showing you people are buying, have to trade on the ask to buy. So let's say it trades, you know, 91.5. And there's a lot of buying there. Well, remember I just said, if I see a lot of buying, I'm looking for a short initially because, you know, unless it gets above that spot, well, that's the key. It will trade, you know, a bunch of volume at 91.5 and it won't pull back at all. Then it'll go to 95 and it'll trade a bunch of volume, won't pull back at all. Then it'll go to, you know, 102 and trade a bunch of, that's what short squeezes look like. And on the tapes here, you just see ask, 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 above ask, above ask, 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 above ask. And you just when I see that, I just click the buy button and just hop on the ride because they can end really fast. But if you catch a nice short squeeze, you know, they're typically 20, 30, 40 uh, NQ points and, you know, 10 or more ES points. So so that's how you see it. It's pretty easy to see. And again, there's a couple of examples. Friday, there was a really brief one. And um, and some of the other uh, Friday closing sessions that's called gaming the close um, in our TRG library, there's there's. We caught short squeezes in the last six months. There's probably three or four, maybe five um, Fridays where it was just ridiculous. There was there was one time that I, I caught the short squeeze. We did it live in the session and I made like 60 NQ points. And you know, everybody watching is like, man, he's a genius. That's so cool. And we're all like patting me on the back. And, and I'm flat. And while we're all patting me on the back, it went another 100 points. So I got 60 of 160. That's a typical short squeeze. You know, but heck, if you can take that many points, you know, that's not a bad thing. But it just was really funny because, you know, I was like, wow, I mean, how much better could it get? And then as soon as I said that, it's like, boom, we're up 60 more points. I'm like, whoa. But that's what they look like. They just have this ridiculous amount of energy. And they're just constantly trading into the ask. Real simple to see. So hopefully that answers your question and is helpful. All right, we're running a light on. This is where Dino usually kind of wraps up. So I'm going to really quickly do um, the Dino psychology part, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the Jigsaw class, and I'll answer any questions. And, and again, questions can be anything you want them to be. It's always open Q&A on uh, the Sunday reopen for TRG members So um, and guests, of course, today. So um, let's see. The Dino thing today, interestingly, um, I had lunch with a guy that I'm coaching who lives in the Midwest and just happens to be out here in, in the Pacific Northwest for a, a social event. And um, it's really interesting to do that because this is somebody that was in TRG from the very beginning in 2019 and has learned a lot along the way. A really young guy. He's in his early 20s. And he's got a full-time job he, and, and a really good one, you know, gives him but flexible. He's got a second shift kind of timing and so he can trade the open. And, and uh, what we did was, uh, we met for, for breakfast and we went through my trading binder, which if you were in, in the, around before TRG in the workshop before TRG, my, my, my 2019 workshop, um, I talked about it a lot. And the, the trading binder is just a, a three ring binder I keep on my desk that has different kind of psychology and, um, and motivation and getting myself centered and you know, focusing and um, what are the things I'm trying to accomplish? Like, you know, I'm, I've got it in my hand right now and I'm just real quickly, I'll just say like the first page says stay in process and it shows my process and the loop that I follow. And then the next page says you have only one objective, remove money from the market consistently. Nothing else matters. That's what scalpers do. And then there's a little thing I tell people all the time. I have three rules, you know, don't lose money, take profits relentlessly, Always protect a profit if you have it. And good trades tend to work right away. If you're sitting in a trade it's, and it's not happening, you're either early or wrong or late, but you know, a good, like a good short, like the one I just did, you know, it worked right away. We were in it for less than a minute. So um, I review those kinds of things. And so anyway, I was showing this to uh, this guy and, and, and this, my, my trading binder is an organic document. So the one I hold in my hands has a couple hundred pages, but a lot of it's older stuff. And so we sat down and we went over through it for about an hour and a half over breakfast and what each of the pages was and, and why I put that page in there. And some of these pages are from, you know, 19, you know, 95, <laughs> you know, I've been doing this, this method of, of organizing myself a long time. And it was just so cool to go through and review all the, the steps I had taken and whether that step ended up being useful or not and what I did next. And, 
And so my Dino message for today is not so much about a trading binder, but keep lots of just notes about what you do and find a way to periodically review them. That is just a ridiculously good way to learn. And I'm not talking about, well, you know, the indicator I bought said buy, so I bought. That's not what I mean. I mean, okay, we opened, we didn't have a lot of volume. We didn't have much of a range. We got to an area that frequently gets sold in NQ, which is above 92. So I put up a short, the short was good. And we got a nice spell and pulled a 20 out of the market. And I would write down that, okay, that works Sundays really consistently. And so then I would start tracking something. Well, what Sundays doesn't that work? And this was one of the documents that was in this binder was the, the work that I did developing the two setups I trade on Sundays, which are this range one we have today and then the gap and go, which you know we didn't get. And um, so we went through all the examples of that and, and you know, it was over a course of about three years that I figured out the setup and the right approach and when it doesn't work and when it does work. And I had documented that all on like four pages of notes. And we went through that. And this was just really fun because he learned a lot from it. And, and it was like reinforcing to my old knowledge, but it, it just, it builds your confidence. That's the best way to describe it. You just realize how far you've come. And so he took away a bunch of really good ideas from that to, uh, to work on his trading binder. And so it was a really fun little get together. Anyway, um, let's see, I see more questions. Okay, we did the short squeeze one. Um, can the price suddenly jump anywhere? It can go 400 points in a second. There's no rules or that look, Roman, it's really simple. The price goes up when more people are buying than selling. And the price goes down when more people are selling than buying. That is all there is to it. We are watching an auction. You know, if you imagine somebody, you know, selling collectible cars, you know, do I hear 87? Do I hear 87 and a half? I've got 87 and a half. Do I hear 88? We just traded 88. You know, do I hear 88 and a half? That's literally what's happening. People are putting up bids and, and offers. So, you know, somebody buying is saying, well, I'll, I'll pay 87. And some guy selling is saying, well, I want 88 and a quarter. And the market will figure it out. You know, who's more aggressive? That's, that's how it works. That's a massive oversimplification, but that's all there is. There's a really good video in our library that Lee did called Why Price Moves. And I strongly recommend that if you don't understand how and why price might suddenly move. What's something that could move us right now a whole lot? Well, let's say, oh, I don't know. Uh, the war in Ukraine ended today, just now. And, and it's the peacetime. They, they've agreed and it's over. The market would go up probably 5% instantly. We'd probably, remember how close the all-time highs are. They're right above us. So, you know, ES is trading right now at 4505. It had been at 4630 and change. The all-time high is 4808. It's right above us. Any good news, that could happen in seconds. That's, that's literally how fast it can happen. Okay, um, let's see. And uh, yep, yeah, that's true. Exactly, Jeffrey. But you, it's really cool, I think, to, to do a binder like that and to, you know, because your, yours discovery is going to be different than mine. But yeah, hopefully I can make it a shorter trip for you. That's the whole idea. That's why we're here. Okay, let's see. In my trading binder, do I use any statistics? That's all I use, is statistics, Dave. You're, you're, you're starting to catch on here. The only thing I do is statistics. Um, but I don't use um, any, you know, all right, I'll tell you all the metrics I use. And again, this is I'm going to talk about this in the class a lot. I'll, I'll switch to introing that in just a second. The, the green on here, the blue on here, crunched together, and these in tan, those are the value areas. The blue lines are the VWAPs, the extremes of the session. You know, this is the session profile. And then the traded volume um, at any given points. That's what you're seeing here. Um, I'm watching the liquidity. This little plot on the bottom of the liquidity maps is showing how the liquidity is changing. That's called stacking and pulling. And this is a tool called a flip chart, which summarizes the stacking and pulling going on in the market. So that's, that's it. There's nothing else I use. I look at footprints for context, but I don't trade off of them. At the moment, we put in the high of the session so far. We left unfinished business up there. Um, structurally, which means we're probably likely to go back up. There's also really strong absorption at the bottom of this opening session, but there's no price rejector down there. So, you know, we could certainly revisit that and see if that absorption holds. So that's what I use, you know, that tool for. But other than that, everything I do is about what's going on in the volume. And then when the market 
is um, open when we're regular trading hours and the equities are trading, I also watch the internals. And that's what these plots here, I have a, a sideways one, uh, just the VIX against the index, the advanced decline, and then real time of the tick, not ticks, but the tick, NYSE tick, and the NASDAQ tick, which is called tick ND. And that's just what's going up and what's going down the net of it. But obviously the equities aren't open right now, so those aren't showing us anything. But again, we're a derivative of those. So I look at those to uh, see what <laughs> the thing we're derived from is doing. Okay, really quickly, let me get to the trading. Come on, Jeff, there we go. But I don't want that one. I want events. I'm just going to bring up the schedule for the jigsaw class because the next thing I'm going to do is I want to just go through this real quick for anybody that has any questions about this is what we're doing in the class that starts a week from yesterday. In other words, this coming Saturday, which is remind me what day is that? The 12th. So this is our summer scalping boot camp. And the schedule is this right here. And I'm going to kind of blow that up just a bit. So we're going to do the introduction on the first Saturday, next Saturday. We're going to talk about all these different tools in Jigsaw. I'm going to show some things in Jigsaw I don't use. And I'm going to show their journaling tool, which is really powerful. And it's built into to Jigsaw. It's called Journalytics. And um, a web page will pop open. And um, it automatically will track you know, where we entered, what the MFE was, what the MAE was. and you know, the result of the trade and profit. And, you know, if we want to track commissions, we can. And, and then you can put whatever comments or hashtags you want. It's a really, really powerful tool. So we're going to talk about that. Then in each session, there's a total of eight sessions that we will do live during the week, during market hours. The first one is going to be the, the Monday right after that. And that's where I'm going to go through what the components are on these domes. And I'm also going to show the stock jigsaw domes, which are much more complex than this. And I'm going to explain, you know, why I I'm I don't use all of the things there and how I got there, because that's a really good long story. I started trading with Jigsaw in 2014, and it's a really powerful set of tools. But it, it's a lot of tools some people need a few of, and if you try to use everything, it's overwhelming. And so the trick is is figuring out what you need to see when, and and uh, I'll go through that. And and it's it's really good to see some of the other things you can use if you're not quite adept, for example, at reading traded volume, there's things called power meters that you can put next to the domes that show you the traded volume and just a display of it, a graphical display, you know, showing like a, a thermometer. And that is really useful when you're new. I used it for years in Jigsaw. And then periodically I go through and I get rid of things. And one day I looked at it and said, you know what? I don't look at those anymore. I'm actually, my eyes are here. They're not over there. So I got rid of it and I never looked back, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be useful to you. And um, so anyway, there's a lot of things like that. Um, we do that on Monday and we're going to go through the, the liquidity maps too, which is basically what Bookmap does is these liquidity maps. Um, so that's built into Jigsaw. You can do that really elegantly in Sierra chart as well. Um, but it's just watching, you know, where is the liquidity? Where are people saying they're going to trade? And then what's happening when we trade there, you know, and that's, that's powerful information. So we'll go through that. We'll go through the difference between the order book and, and the volume that's traded. And that, that's the power of liquidity. Um, the following week, we have three more sessions. And, um, we're going to go, excuse me, there's two a week for three weeks. So that's the first week. The second week, we're going to talk about the power meters and the tapes. That's what I'm doing over here, which gives you a sense of the momentum. As Roman correctly pointed out, nothing's happening right now. But if you watch that tape right there when we open or when there's a sudden change of momentum, it will suddenly speed up. And boy, a big block of trades on the bid there, but we didn't go down. So those sellers got absorbed. This is either a decent spot to nibble short or we're probably gonna trade a little higher soon. So anyway, um, there's a lot of power in understanding how to read that tool. That isn't just, well, what's the price and how many contracts traded, but this will move really fast, which is why I have a filtered one with more blocks when the market momentum suddenly picks up and I'll, I'll, it'll just immediately alert me, whoa, the momentum just, momentum just picked up. You know, do I wanna join that momentum? Is a short squeeze starting? Or you know, what happened? Did some news come out? Whatever, you know, it, it tells you the trading suddenly got more active and that's, that's huge, it's a big advantage. So we'll talk about that. And the intelligent order management, which is really cool in Jigsaw. I'm gonna really quickly just uh, switch to a, a sim just to show you that because I don't wanna just do random trades here, but 
Yeah, boy, we're not moving very much. I may not be able to show you that actually. Yeah, you know what? We're not moving enough. I showed it Friday um, and I showed it at NFP on Friday. And the, that was one of the previous sessions. Basically, just clicking on the price, you can move your orders around. And, and, uh, and it knows, you know, if I'm above where I'm long, it knows I'm putting up targets. And if I'm below it, it knows their stops. And I don't have to select the order types and all that. I just click on the dome. And, ooh, that was a nice little pop-up. Remember I just said that was going to happen at, when we were at 92 and getting absorbed? And now we're at 95. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's, not, it's not that I, I have a crystal ball. It's just when, when we trade into the bid and it doesn't go down, we're going to go up. All right, now I might be able to play one here. You know what? Let's just try scaling a bunch of little shorts here. And again, I'm doing this in a sim so I can show you the order management. Let's throw some more up. Try to get, uh, trying to, there we go. Okay, now we got a two lot. So, you know, let's say I got a target down here and a target here. And uh, let's put another one there. Oh, we got filled. So now we have three. That's good. Let's put one target there. So this is the way the intelligent order management works. Let's say, you know, I'm going to let it come to these, but all of a sudden it sharply moves down to 92 and these fill and this one doesn't. All I've got to do to move that one up is just click up here and I can move them around. See what I'm doing? So I can instantly change where that order is. I can also do some really cool stuff like uh, limit to price and it will put them all in one place like that. And I also bought one at the same time. That, that one got, excuse me, sold one more. So, so there's all kinds of cool things you can do right on the dome just by clicking on it. And that's what I call the intelligent order management. It's very powerful. So um, it's hard to show unless we're moving around a lot though. So let's throw a couple of targets there. Again, this is a two micros now and we're not moving. I'm just trying to show you that part of it. Let's see if we can get maybe a sweep down and I'll, yeah, come on, ah, 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 we're a tick from a fill. There we go. People are getting out of the way. That's what those Q's numbers mean, bingo. So now, you know, let's say I want to put a stop there. And who knows, I might catch a move all the way to the other end of the range. And I can move that stop just by clicking on a different price. Like now it's there. But I don't want to get too close because it's going to get filled if I do. And there it goes. So that's called intelligent order management. And it's very cool. Um, you can't do that in Sierra. That is the one major thing that Sierra cannot do at all. Yeah, you can make yourself buttons and you can drag and drop, and but you just can't do it that elegantly. There's just no other platform than other than TT that that do it that way. And um, but TT is ridiculously expensive. That's trading technologies. So anyway, then after that, we're going to put the jigsaw puzzle together. How all the pieces work. I have a document in the pit that I put in traders' faces all the time, particularly people that I coach, because literally this is everything that I do. And um, it's called elements of my decision process. And so we're going to go through that and how I make decisions to take a trade or not. And this is it right here. And, you know, what's the time of day? That's the first one, because every time of the day is different. You can't trade the overnight like the open. They're totally different. And the close is different than the open. Which way are we going? Right fracking now. That's all that matters. Trends are for amateurs. There are no trends. It's where are we going right now? And with how much momentum and is that momentum changing? How? And, and I go through the tools I use to figure that out. It's real simple. It's not like, you know, complicated. You don't need an indicator, you know, buy, sell here. It tells you what's going on and you can make good decisions. That's what good trading is about. And then are there any sweeps? Sweeps can be dangerous, but they can also be friendly. That's when, you know, somebody trades a large order and it sweeps through the book. I try to trade in places where sweeps will be friendly. In other words, they'll take me to my targets or they'll take me to my entries with a sudden sharp move um, because that's always a good thing in futures, a sudden sharp move. Um, so anyway, that's what that's about. Obviously, where's the liquidity? We talked about that. What's the current range? And then high volume and low volume nodes, um, particularly once we've had some volume. And um, you know, it's early for that right now, but you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I crunch NQ like this is I can see where the volume is and see how there's nothing at the low and we're trading at the high and all the volumes up here that that is going to go up. That's just the way it is. <laughs> you know, that that means this this is a poor weak high that's called. If you look at a TPO view of it, you know, you'll see like a just an unfinished top there. Well, again, it's a little early for this, but it, we just haven't finished going up yet. That's what that means. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to do it on this pulse in this you know, in this time frame, but it means, you know, the odds are really strong it's going to break. So just shorting it wouldn't make a lot of sense. You, you have to short it at a spot that's statistically advantageous to you. So, and again, if I looked at the structure, I haven't in a minute, but I bet it's saying the same thing. Yeah, we've got UB up there and we're right there. We're two ticks from that UB ledge. 
and you know unfinished business and market profile we're going to go up it, you know how far who knows when who knows you know the liquidity starts at eight and then there's more at 10 and 12 in es it's at six and a half the liquidity is at one and eight a little bit at two in nq so you know could i get filled there yeah probably in fact that's probably too high up again looking at this liquidity it's probably a better bet right about there if that ledge breaks although that's a ridiculous oh we're in the sim let's get out of the sim just because sims are for people that don't want to trade <laughs> and i want to trade so let's get a real order up there maybe right there and again, I'm just, you know, if it overshoots this by just a little bit again, I'll get filled. It's probably going to go a little higher, but there's a bunch of liquidity up there. And, you know, I probably won't get filled. So I'm front running it a little tiny bit this time more. Just so maybe we'll get lucky and we'll see if Phil. Okay, I will, I will get back to uh, the questions in just a minute. I want to just wrap up the syllabus. So putting the pieces together, you know, you'll understand all the different things that I do to scalp this way and then the following week we're just going to have a blast we're just we're going to just trade it we're going to do scalping examples using the tools for uh for about four hours and then the following saturday we'll wrap up and we'll go through any q a and you know if where you are in your learning curve what you should do next you know yada 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 so anyway uh jvc is going to put a link in the chat to the class and the coupon code for those that want to sign up, you can get 200 bucks off. So that whole class is only 299, which is absurdly cheap. And um, let me get to the questions. Let's see. So I answered the statistics question. Biden news, Biden fell down the stairs. Yeah, all right, whatever. Um, let's see, you mentioned the auction process. If the price is too high, then it's a short. Yes, but... The auction process, that's a good way to put this. If you get a price rejector at the high of a range, which is, which is where it both exhausts and it gets absorbed, then it's a good spot to potentially play short. But it's not an automatic short, no. That, you know, because often the top of a buying range is not going to necessarily go right back down, but it's just going to stop going up. So, and that's kind of what we're seeing today. We're not seeing big giant moves down, but the breakouts of the of the, the edge of the range, the ledge, are not going anywhere either. So the statistical best best play right now is to let these ledges on the upside break and then fade them because it's going to go back into the range. It's a range bound market. So that would be the play. So um, you know, I don't know where the auction's going to roll over, but if I see absorption and exhaustion, then for the moment, that's the short. So you know, you, your question is kind of on the right track, but I'm not sure by the way you're using the words that you understand it or not. But price being too high is not a short because price can be too high for a real long, long time and stay that way. That's called a short squeeze because all the retail people jump in short, you know, on the, on the failed breakout and, and, you know, the absorption, they say, oh, wow, it's getting absorbed. Let's get short. And then the, the buyers just reassert themselves and, Short squeeze, you know, and, and they'll do that to you over and over again if you don't understand how to read the traded volume. And uh, yeah, gosh, anybody that's tried to trade with, with just that, without understanding that second level of that, it, you know, that second layer of information just, just gets run over. You, know? you can't just say, well, if, you, know, how, you gotta figure out where is price too high? Well, we do that a variety of ways. One of the things I look at is I look at standard deviations of the volume. I showed you that. And now that we've been open for a few minutes, we can actually do that for this session. And this is what that looks like. This is just a think or swim chart. But you know what? Let me bring over the Ninja one. It's easier to read with this little tiny amount of volume. So here's from my other window, the Ninja one. And you can see Friday, you know, that, that we got up to SD2 at the high here in NASDAQ. And then that's when that big sell-off started. We talked about that. And it sold all the way off to, the second standard deviation of the VWAP going the other way. So it was at one statistical extreme and it went to the other. You know, could it have gone higher? Yeah, but you know, this is based on a bell-shaped curve. You know, if you're at one standard deviation, which are the white lines, that's not very significant, 67%. You get to two, you're at 95%. You get to three, you're at 99%. You get to four, you're at 99.99%. That doesn't mean it won't keep going up. It loves to head fake. See what it did right there? You know, that was the, the second standard deviation, the 95% spot, and it overshot it by a bit. And then the seller said, okay, now, and they, and that happened by taking out shorts 
who were starting to short there. <laughs> And there was a little baby short squeeze. You can see it. People were right here. We're selling SD2 and the top of the value area. And those guys got a couple of ticks. And then the buyer said, OK, F you. Stopped all those guys out. We blew above SD2. And then the sellers reasserted themselves really aggressively. That's classic. You know, let's just, let's just sweep the rookies out of their positions behavior. We see it all the time. And again, it's because a lot of people just don't understand how to trade futures. And uh, once you do it, you know, it, it's all of a sudden like, yeah, well, that's the crystal ball is just want to understand how futures work, you know, how, and, and it takes some work to do that. It, you can't just buy an indicator. Yeah. Oh, you can have, I have, a, I have MZ pack on my Ninja trader. I have order flow. Maybe, but do you know how to read it? <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it's not just whether MZ pack tells you to sell up there or not, you know, that that's meaningless. You have to actually look at the numbers and, and how it's trading and, and read it for yourself. That's what's powerful. You know, look at this again. We haven't finished the, the auction up there. We haven't pulled back much at all. And we can see the nature of the trade on the bid versus the ask. So yeah, again, the, the, you don't need any piece of software to look at that and say, it's going to go through there at some point. You know, when, who knows, but it will. So, okay. Are there any bots in futures? Yes, there's, you know, let's define a bot. If somebody using a trading algorithm, large hedge funds use them as execution tools. You know, they don't just turn them on and go surfing. You know, bots don't work that way. A bot gets turned on when the set of conditions exists that that bot was designed to take advantage of. And, and I just ran an entire two week class on how to do that. <laughs> exactly, JVC had just finished a class on how to build bots in Sierra Chart. And, and, you know, you got, it, it's a long learning curve to even understand that space. But yes, the answer is yes. Um, do they trade in NQ? Yeah, but there's less of them over there. They're the most prevalent in ES because it's the most liquid. And for a bot to work, it needs liquidity. So that's one of the reasons I don't trade ES anymore. I used to trade a lot. Um, used to trade YM real aggressively. I still do that one sometimes, RTY. But I, I prefer MNQ because number one, you know, the, the, the pure range we get is so big that, you know, if you have a, a 20 point range in ES, or a 30 point range in ES, it's really skilled to get three, four points out of that. You've got to be a really good trader. But over in NASDAQ that same day, you might have 300 points. So peeling 20 points out of that is a piece of cake. You just got to patiently wait for the extremes. And then when they exhaust and absorb, bam. Or if they're not exhausting or absorbing, Go with them. It's that simple. Good questions. Are there? Is there an exhaustion indicator? Seller? Ex yeah. Um, that that's kind of what some of Lee's tools use. The emoji tools, like what we call a price rejector. That's a tool that shows you both exhaustion and absorption happening at the same time. And I I might be able to show you one on one of these views. Um, let's see. Um, hang on a second. I'm sure I can find one here. Whoops. I the really simple this. answer, though, is yes, absolutely. You can see exhaustion on a, on a footprint. Yeah. No question. Yeah, right, here it is right here. Or whatever. Yeah, right here on this, this candle right here. This is a 30-minute period. That is what we call a price rejector, and that is both exhaustion and absorption. So if you see that happening and there's a ton of supply up here, you short it. And by the way, that was the high that we've been talking about. It happened Friday, and it just got crushed on the way down. Here's another one of those, another price rejector. It exhausted at the top. And it was more aggressive selling at each lower level. So it just kept going. So, um, you know, it, th this tool highlights it. But, you know, I could turn these things off and you could still see that behavior. It just highlights it for me. That's called um, the Price Rejector Pro. That's the name of Lee's tool that he sells for that. And watch this. See, I'll get rid of it. It's still there. I can still see zero by seven. Yeah, I can see that's exhaustion and absorption right there, but you got to learn how to read that. And that's what the $25 make ticks classes, they go through what you're looking for and how to read it. Um, that's why we created those because yeah, it takes some time to learn. It's not rocket science, but you got to study and practice like anything that's worthwhile. Let me turn that sky back on. Okay. Or you can buy the tool, but we, you know, Lee's the kind of guy, he'll tell you this right up front. He won't sell you the tools unless you know how to read it or you're willing to invest in it because you know, just seeing the red thing up there or the red thing here isn't enough. You've got to understand what it means and why. And so I just cancel those orders here. Uh, let me cancel that other one. Okay. So um, good questions. Really good questions. Uh, how long does it take to learn? Are there any shortcuts in this business? 
Uh, I have no idea what the percentage is, um, Roman. Absolutely none. And I don't care. It's meaningless information. Um, let's see. How long does it take to learn? Okay. We get asked this a lot in TRG, and here's my honest answer. Uh, you will be clueless for the better part of a year. Um, and if you work hard during that year, at the end of the year, you'll understand what you need to learn and what you don't. Okay. The second year, you can kind of start being the setups and stuff. If you work really hard in that second year, that's about the earliest you could possibly think about consistent profitability. In general, it's more like year four. Um, for me in futures, uh, you know, I started trading futures in 1985 by going to the pit and trading, you know, calling orders in and signaling them in. And so, you know, I understood that the kind of energy of markets better than most, but still, once I started learning order flow, um, the, the, all this form of data, you know, these kinds of footprint charts and, you know, the trade on the bid, that's all relatively new. You know, that was kind of invented in the, the like 2010 ish, you know, market Delta 2008. It was, you know, that's the first guys that did that. And then a few other guys came along, Investor RT, you know, then market Delta went out of business and Sierra chart formed and, and that was the beginning of the kind of order flow revolution, which is, you know, it, it basically made technical analysis completely obsolete because technical, technical analysis is looking at patterns in the past to try to predict the future and the market doesn't work like that. But before order flow, that's all we had, you know, it would give you at best, maybe a decent guess. But now there's literally hedge funds that exist. One of my buddies runs one. He has $750, on, $750 million under management. And all he does is, is play off of technical analysis levels. In other words, overrunning them. Because th there's so many retail traders that'll trade at fibs and pivots. And so his entire fund, all they do is they run people over that are trading there. So like if, if you're selling the top of, you know, you're selling R3, he'll jump in and, and buy the heck out of that. So it pushes it past, you know, two points in the EF, which is where most retail stops are. And then he'll sell the hell out of it. So you know, he's just taking advantage of the fact that you don't know what you're doing and that he has more money than you to push the market around. And, and there's a lot of big funds that do stuff like that. Some people mistakenly say, well, the market makers do this or that. There are no market makers in futures. There are large traders and there are small traders, but everybody makes a market. You put up an order, you're making a market. You know, some people put up a thousand at a time. Okay, they're bigger, but they're not market makers. I constantly see, oh, the MMs are pushing it up. Nonsense. You know, there aren't any. Anyway, but, you know, that's just rookies going to the wrong education and listening to people that don't know what they're talking about. There's a lot of them around. Fortunately, I'll add we put, something, but yeah, if please, you don't mind, please, uh, to, go, please to do. the question about shortcuts, I, I would, having been chasing, by the way, but chasing this trading dream for about 24 years now, uh, and finally in the last four, uh, thanks to TRG, making like real, meaningful, objectively measurable progress uh, and really getting somewhere, um, the shortcut is to find somebody or somebody's uh, that I would say have two particular qualities. Number one, ideally, they're good at doing it. Um, although I would personally argue that even more important than them actually being good at trading themselves is that they're good at explaining slash teaching it. Because right. there are lots of brilliant traders out there. I mean, you know, the, the pit guys, like, you know, they, oh, yeah. they made fortunes and what they probably couldn't teach you anything about how to do what they do, um, oh, yep. you know, especially in the electronic world. So, yep. you know, you, you got to find somebody who not only understands you know what's going on here but can actually explain and break down very complex things into fairly simple understandable followable processes that is right. exactly absolutely key and that's also a good note about my background i'm a professional teacher um in addition to being a professional trader my my career was um i i i went to UCLA, I studied economics and Asian philosophy, went to B school there, um, marketing and finance. I ran a couple of businesses while I was doing that. And then I got hired by IBM in 1980 and they were about to launch the PC and that was the absolute best time on the planet to join IBM. And I uh, made a bunch of money in three years and then hopped to a startup making Apple software. We were on the Macintosh development team. And um, so that always gave me the freedom to trade. 
And I'd been trading, you know, since before I got to UCLA, I trade options at UCLA by running out of my classes and calling my broker because he was a cell phone. And, um, and I tracked the prices on a little radio receiver. And anyway, um, so, you know, long story short, um, after that, um, what I did at IBM was sales. And then I went into sales training and, and became a venture capitalist. So I was constantly doing presentations and teaching people. And I've taught college at UCLA and a half a dozen uh, uh, community colleges around the country and, and adult schools and all kinds of different top topics, trading, economics, Asian philosophy, a, a bunch of things, um, and to various business skills of, of different types. And so, um, you know, one thing I think pretty much is agreed on um, that we have good teachers. Lee also has a background in sales training and uh, also as an entrepreneur and been through a bunch of different businesses. And I've been through 25 startups in one way or another, either as an employee or as a, a an investor or as, you know, board member and whatnot. And uh, so you just get really good at, at teaching and, and also teaching what matters. And so I, I think that's one of the real real strengths of TRG is that we have good instructors and, you know, we're speaking from experience, you know, um, I'm the old man, the Dino, you know, with 50 years, Lee's been at it 25, not 35 now, you know, JVC, he's our community manager, 25, you know, and, and there's a lot of people with a lot of experience. So, okay. There's some good comments. Oh, unlearning. Yeah. That's so important, Todd. Yeah. We, we have a, a saying that before every class, and I'm going to say it before the jigsaw class, you know, on the opening session, we need you to be tabula rasa. That's a word for a blank slate. Don't bring anything you think, you know, because it's probably wrong. There's just not people that get a lot of good information and there's a lot of people selling nonsense. And, uh, and, and, and so you get a lot of bad habits and you don't know what the right answers are until you find them. And when you do, then you're like, oh my God, this is so clear. You know, why did I waste all that time on buying, you know, indicators and listening to idiots? Well, you know, you got to find the people and you know, there's a lot of noise out there. And we all, we've all been down that road. Um, let's see. Dee, 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 dee. We did that. We did that. So there are funds that run people stops. Exactly. That's what my buddies does. That retail stops are just so predictable. I can tell you where they are right now. If, if you look at ES, the high of ES is 7.5. Let's say we got up there and it was really aggressively getting sold. You know, you can see that the aggressive passives are sitting, you know, at 10 and at 12 and up here at 15. You know, that's the smart trader saying, okay, let it come to me and I'll just, I'll sell 400 up there. And so, but the retail trader, you know, will break seven and a half and, you know, maybe he'll short it at eight and a half. And all you got to do is move it two points and he stops out. The average retail stop is two points. So get it to 10, he stops out. And guess what? That's where all the liquidity is ready to sell. So your stop, you buying your trade back, he's the guy selling to you, getting short when you're closing your short out. That happens over and over again in futures. And that's not only you, that, they were the ones buying to push it up there in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's how they got it up there. They knew they could do that up there. It's just such a predictable behavior. Or the other way they do it is they get the guys to buy the breakout and make it long. Oh, it's a breakout. We're going up. You know. And then again, they fade it up. And it, particularly if you watch this in NQ, I call it flushing the toilet. We'll break a ledge like this and we'll go 99, you know, and it'll pop up to like 02 and it'll try to pull back to like zero and you can see people selling it and then we'll be at seven, you know, and we'll, we'll work our way up to about 20. And then you'll see that just there's no more people trying to short it. And then all of a sudden somebody will throw a 500 lot at the tape and NQ, that's a lot. And we will drop like 30 points in seconds. And you see that every day, all regular trading session, it's, it's, it's flushing the, the, the shorts out. Yeah. Let them get short, let them stop out. And then we'll flush the toilet and we'll take everybody out on the way down. And they do it. It's, it's artwork watching it happen. And once you see it, you, you just learn to go with it. They know more than you do. So just hop on board what they're doing and you'll, you'll be fine. Um, let's see. As a former poker player, I know. Oh, okay. I am a semi-professional poker player. That is one of my skills. I didn't mention that. I've played in tournaments all over the place and I'm reasonably good. So when some lose money, he can be very aggressive. Well, that's an idiot. That's not a poker player. That's not how you play poker. Um, when you play poker, you read what the other hand has and your aggression is based on your read of the other hand. It has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, being aggressive just when you feel like it. That's nonsense. That's not how poker is played. 
But when you bet against the bot, there's no aggression, any kind of tilts. You're talking about like online trade, uh, poker trading. Oh, that's, that's God, unless you're doing it in a really um, official spot and there aren't many, most of those online games are, are really, really, really manipulated. If you don't already know that, you know, there's a few places they're not, but um, in general, online poker, I, a lot of the old firms got shut down because of that, because they were literally, you know, faking the cards even. So um, I'm talking about I, I, a poker I kinda, tournament. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, let me, let me answer it, finish yeah. saying this. Um, I, I trade poker in face-to-face -face tournaments because number one, poker, you need to see the other players. So virtually makes no sense. And, uh, and, and you bet based on what your statistical evaluation, just like in trading, is of the other players. You know, I, I gave a guy an example today. You know, I, this happened to me a week ago at a poker game. Um, I was first to bet and um, I, I had kings, a pair of kings. So I opened with a three bet and a couple of people checked, a couple of people folded. And then we got to the guy on the other side of the table from me. He looks at me and he does a three bet on top of my three bet. So he goes over the top of me by three times. All right. I have a decision instantly. Either he's got aces or he's a big bluffer and nobody big bluffs like that in a cash tournament. So I instantly folded because that was the right thing to do. I'm not going to take out a pair of aces with a pair of kings. Not going to happen. If I had a suited ace king, maybe, you know, I get a straight flush. But um, so that's an example of, of how you do that in poker. You're, what are the odds? You, again, you're, it's always about the odds. That's how you trade. That's how you play poker. That's how you do anything. JVC, go ahead. What were you going to say? Sure. So, Roman, tell me if I'm wrong here. But I, the way I have interpreted what you're asking is I think you're asking about if most of the volume in the futures markets is – uh, you know, big firms, bots, funds, you know, whatever. Um, is there just a lack of emotion? You know, how do you how do you trade against an opponent who will never get emotional, et cetera? And I, I think number one, you're you're making a little bit too strong of a an analogy to poker. Yes, there's a there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of overlap between poker, which by the way, I don't play. Um, I I understand how it works, but I don't play it. Um, but there's there's a lot of similarity between the two. But you know, trading is not poker. Um, right. you know, they are are distinctly different in a lot of important ways. Oh um, yeah. You know, one very, very two, major important one is you can bluff. You can't bluff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're <laughs> not you're not bluffing in the markets. No, that ain't mm -hmm. gonna happen. Unless unless you can put up, you know, a, a three thousand lot on the tape, you know, good luck with, with that. Um, but uh, you know, so the the other thing is that the the main emotions you're gonna see in, in the market and you're gonna find yourself dealing with in the market are gonna be you. It's it's not going to be anyone else. It's going to be just you exactly. not beating yourself up because you took a loss or not getting greedy and going, oh, I, I can squeeze some more out of this. I know I can just because I want it, you know, and all of that stuff. And that's a whole journey all by itself. There is so much of yourself that has to get conquered first before you will make any meaningful progress. But once you get a grip on, and that does not, by the way, contrary to what some people online have seen say, I think it does not at all mean, you know, don't have emotions, trade without emotions. That, no, that's silly. you just you, learn to human. understand your yes, emotions. That's all. Yeah, exactly. Understand them when they're there and understand how to cope with them and understand that they are chemicals in your bloodstream. And there are things you can do to flush them out quicker. And, and we've talked yeah. about a lot of this stuff in TRG and it's really oh, important. Yeah. yeah. By the way, a book on this topic that you definitely should read is Thinking in yes. Death. That's how you, that's how you, this is by a poker player who's a trader and a really bright lady. And th this, this is the way you do both. And it's a really simple, short book, you know, and you can buy it on anywhere books are sold. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, a fun anyway. read. It's a good one. Oh, it's a great read. Yeah. And all her books are, she's got a couple others. Okay. So are there any questions about anything we've talked about? We're running a little bit long here, which I'm happy to do, but um, I, uh, you yeah, know, if we keep, Questions keep coming. I'll keep answering them, but I think we've exhausted the questions. So are there any others? Are there any um, anything about the class you want to ask or anything about TRG or uh, about my trading or, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm the, the, the scalper and lead scalper and scalping educator in TRG. That's all I do. I, you know, sometimes I catch ridiculously big swings by you know, trading a good scalp entry at one end of the extreme or the other. That often works that way. You get a big runner, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. I don't look for that. Um, on the other hand, um, we have 
people like my partner Lee and and uh, JVC as well that trade more structurally. So they're looking at the session and they're looking at the, the stuff that I had up before. Uh, the order flow in, you know, market profile periods, you know, which are every half an hour, and they're making decisions based on that. And I use that for context, but it's a different style of trading. And, and we do have, you know, that and education for that in TRG. So just to be clear, you know, we don't just scalp, but that's all I do. Um, I, I understand structural trading and I've done it <laughs> because my personality doesn't match it. I'm high energy and I want to get in and out quickly and, you know, scalping, fits all pieces of that and and I can do it any time of the day or night. I just need a market that's moving and I can scalp it. So do I trade Bitcoin? I wouldn't trade Bitcoin with your money, Roman. It's a Ponzi scheme and it's a complete waste of time and you can't get volume information and the dealers, it, it's, it's like the FX market, you know, um, the foreign exchange, you know, currency pairs. They're the worst markets to trade on the planet, but a lot of, you know, unscrupulous dealers, you know, market incessantly because it's easy, you know, get rich quick in Bitcoin, you know, yeah, get poor quick in Bitcoin. JVC, you want to do a quick Bitcoin story? <laughs> or not? Sorry, say that again? Bitcoin, your Bitcoin experience, oh, you're a Bitcoin sure. millionaire. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, I, I do own some crypto. Uh, I still have some. I got active in crypto starting about 2014. And I, I literally wrote a, a small, relatively small amount of money up to just over a million, $1.1 million, uh, and then proceeded to sit and watch it evaporate. Um, and, you know, it evaporated. I, I sold a little bit on the way down, but, you know, nothing, nothing substantial enough to really move the needle in my life. So um, what I discovered, what I didn't understand about crypto, uh, in particular crypto, but it applies to Forex as well, like Jeff was saying, um, until I was in TRG and I started to really understand futures, was that crypto is the absolute, and, and despite, I am still a, a long-term fan believer in crypto. I think it's going to be big deal, et cetera, et cetera. But it is the worst, well, it's tied for the worst with Forex, for, yeah. worst, for worst trading vehicle as a trading vehicle you want you want to buy some and just sit on it because you think something in five years is going to blow up or whatever okay fine go ahead but as a trading vehicle it's garbage because as jeff said there's no centralized volume information which i know you know decentralization that's a big like one of the big pluses and you know of crypto etc is decentralization but the trade-off there is how do you trade something when there's no centralization of the volume information because volume is all that actually moves markets. Volume is everything. If you don't have volume, you should not even dream of trading that thing unless it's just a, you just want to gamble. And if you want to gamble and you know that's what you're doing, okay, fine, gamble, yeah. have fun. Um, but if you want to be a serious trader of something, you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to have volume information. I would even go so far as to say that even in equities, you don't have, you have much more centralized volume than you do in something like a crypto. You've got, you know, your half dozen to a dozen primary exchanges where everything happens most of the volume but then you got the over the counter stuff that you can't see in the dark pools right. and there's all such uh, nonsense out there that you will never know about you will not be able to act on so again i'm not ever touching stocks again i have no desire to ever touch stocks again and i've done it in the past but no thank you futures are clean and transparent and you can see everything it's a level playing field you know yes some people have faster Connectivity and obviously more money and experience and better algos and MIT mathematicians and whatever. Sure, everybody's got their their edges, but the basic playing field is level. I have access to the same information that anybody else does. I can make the same decisions, good or bad, that anybody else does, and so can you. Right, and and that's that's really what's important because your edge is your edge. If you, and so all you want is a level playing field to use your edge. Yep. And you, you know, the, the vast majority, for example, of FX volume is made up. The dealer, because the guy you're buying and selling through is the counterparty to your trade. And so you, you're automatically at a disadvantage. You know, he can, he can front run your order. It's legal. And it's just, that's criminal, but that's the way it works. You know, so let's say you put an order in to buy it, you know, two. He can say, you know, um, He'll buy it too, and then he'll sell to you two ten. You know, they, they can do that. They're allowed to do that, and you know, you, you just never know what's really going on. It's it's not a place to play if you want to make money consistently. That by far the futures market, and there's a lot of futures contracts. You know, commodities, the soft commodities, the grains. You know, 
pork bellies, hogs, there's a million things you can trade, but the indexes are the most liquid, fast moving markets. And since they're derived from the equities, the equities give you a powerful thing to compare what's happening with. For example, one of the things I look at during the trading day is a heat map like this. And this tells me not just, you know, whether the indexes are up or down, but what's up and down. And, you know, here's the NASDAQ. Wow, that was, you know, a bad day for Apple. We know about that. It was earnings and Amazon was fairly strong. You know, so this is not a market that was rallying. That was why that short was so clear because it looked like this at the highs too. And then it got sold really aggressively. And, you know, then you can look at the S&P 500. You know, those are largely in it weighted as well. If you trade the Russell, you, know, you can see what's going on. And you, you, so you just have so much more information and that's power, you know, knowledge is power and information is critical to, to, to making the right decisions. It's that simple. Okay, are there any other questions or comments or burning desires? That's in TRG, right before we wrap up, I always say, are there any burning desires? You know, something you just have to ask right now or get off your chest, otherwise we, we will wrap up. And again, by all means, please check out our class. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Todd, for posting that. Todd's a TRG member and I appreciate it, Roman. Thank you for coming. Again, other guests, uh, JF, thank you for coming. Good questions, by the way. Keep it up. You're you're thinking the correct way. You're questioning assumptions, and that's you know I, I'm a child of the '60s, and you know one of the my first my parents were you know hippies, but not really. My dad was an executive at Mattel, but you know they'd smoke pot on the weekend and play folk music with their friends and open the new Beatles album. And one of the first things they taught me: question authority, question your assumptions, and you know that in trading education that's critical. Because most of the things you think you know or you think are right probably aren't. And the things that are right are so absurdly simple. Like, guess what? We just got to the bottom of the value area right here. What happened? Well, let's see. We traded almost exclusively on the bid and we went up. So the bottom of the value area got bought. That is straight out of the market profile textbook. It's called responsive buying. Responsive buying at the bottom of the value area. Responsive selling is at the top of the value area, which we just saw a minute ago up here. So again, you could have instantly jumped in there long when you saw the volume there and you'd be up you know, eight points here. So that's the kind of stuff that is the important information. All right. Real quick um, uh, reminder for everybody, yeah. by the way, just in addition to, of course, there's you know, Jeff's uh, um, scalping boot camp is starting next week. And there's the uh, the discount code uh, early bird is up in the chat. If you scroll back, you can see that. But in addition to that, even if you're you're uh, not interested or can't afford or whatever the scalping class, I, I cannot suggest more strongly to if you haven't already go get the online courses from TRG trading research group dot com for twenty five bucks, uh, you know, which frankly, at one point it was free. And what we found was that people would sign up and then never use the course, never bother to take it. And it's just that's that's so like offensive to those of us who, who have put so much effort into this. It's like you you handed this and you won't use it. So we decided, all right, let's make it 25 bucks. That, that is such a small amount of money. Anybody who's serious can make an investment. And hopefully if they have at least a little tiny bit of skin in the game, they will actually bother to freaking do the course and get right. into the community and participate. So for $25, right. you're not going to find anything better out there. Um, it's it's great. Great material, and it will give you access to the um, uh, course student level access into the community. You can be in there and ask questions. You can talk to me. You can talk to Jeff. You can talk to Lee. Yeah. You can talk to other members. Uh, check it out. It's it's you know I, I contributed quite a bit to the course. I you know along with obviously Jeff and Lee made most of the content, and and I uh, you know threw in my two cents where I could. And it is really really good. And I see yeah. that objectively so we've we, and we've gotten some really good feedback on it. and i, I just, it's yep. up on the screen right now you just you know it's right here tick maker you click there 25 bucks and uh i guarantee you will learn some we've never had anybody say that wasn't very good i want my nope. money back it is <laughs> in fact quite the opposite <laughs> yeah <laughs> we had so many people doing, tell us this is the best member yeah yeah we've had yeah. so many people tell us this is by far the best material i've ever seen on the subject and it's like you know a, a teeny fraction of the price that i've paid for everything else that's out there this is ridiculous like Ah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, the, yeah, the Axia course is, is five thousand dollars. Thousands, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, this is twenty-five bucks. And it, it covers almost all the same material. Yeah. Um, so already, and no, I'm not, not ragging on Axia, they're great people, but you know, they 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 publicly say they're really not interested in education. They're looking for traders for the trading floor, and so they, they make their education very expensive. And uh, they used to be the only thing out there. So, you know, 
Uh, there are cheaper alternatives now that are Times as good have as changed. Good. Yes. All right. Any other questions, comments? Last chance. Otherwise, we're going to wrap her up here. And thank you again. It was a great session. I enjoyed doing it. I hope you learned something. And I hope you'll join us either for the Tickmaker courses or for the upcoming uh, Jigsaw Scalping class. Yeah, or become we'll a member. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we yeah. got Ides of Monday in the morning, of course, as it's a, yeah. another week. So we'll see yep, the TRG is... members tomorrow morning, bright and early. Yeah, yeah. This is our schedule this week. The regular TRG classes, Ides of Monday, Karen Feeding of Inflection Points Tuesday, Darren's Dojo Wednesday, Lee Trading the Stats on Thursday, me gaming the clothes on Friday, and then we're back at Dino's Recap next weekend. So we do the same cycle every week or with some changes, like, you know, I change courses each month, but it roughly follows that pattern. All righty. Thanks again. We'll see you guys later. Have a good one. Don't don't get too ambitious here tonight. I, the market's, again, trying to decide where the low is here. I wouldn't be surprised if it tries to test the low, and that, that could get interesting. You know, we, we broke through. We See, again, the bottom of the value area got bought, and now it's kind of trading a little bit below that. So, you know, that, that trade would have worked the first time and not this time. I hear I would, I would wait and see how much lower it might want to go. All right. Thanks, Alfredo. Um, I will see you guys later. Have a good one.